to onto our slide. So um, I guess, is it my turn to go or uh, should I? Yes, go. All right. Uh, so our main take on this bill is that it is a great big bait and switch. Um, it, this bill was kind of floated by the government as the bill that was going to deliver on urban densification, on uh, transforming existing neighborhoods into complete communities. And they did a week or so of kind of scamming organizations like More Neighbors Toronto that were interested in more housing supply into thinking that this was going to deliver. And they presented a speech to the Toronto Board of Trade that was all focused, focused on urban densification and mentioned not a thing about uh, rural sprawl or uh, destruction of wetlands. But what this really is, is um, very weak and often uh, counterproductive measures on densification. And the main thrust of the bill is an attack on conservation authorities, woodlands and uh, provincially significant wetlands and attacks on regional planning that are designed to force people into sprawl. And uh, you know the real emphasis here is on just unlocking the contested countryside and the vast majority of wetlands that are currently protected uh, as places that can actually be paved and filled in. Uh, so first of all, you know the most glaring feature of this bill and its associated policy proposals is an attack on conservation authorities, woodlands, and provincially significant wetlands that is aimed to open those up for destruction in the way they haven't been for years, not even under the Harris government where they in any way uh, threatened in this way. Uh, so across Ontario, uh, while they probably shouldn't do this, you know, many municipalities leave it up to conservation authorities to use the refusal of permits and their comments on planning applications to ensure that sprawl doesn't destroy uh, both the ecological function of habitats and the water bodies they protect or destroy those wetlands altogether. But this bill prohibits conservation authorities effectively from doing anything to prevent sprawl from causing flooding or erosion or destroying ecology that really matters. It would leave vast swaths of Ontario's most important habitats largely unprotected and put Ontarians at real risk. Uh, this measure is useless as a spur to housing supply because Ontario has more than enough room in existing neighborhoods and in land already designated for development, then it will need for housing for many decades. So in particular, what the bill does <laughs> is it uh, prohibits conservation authorities or it removes any requirement for a conservation authority permit for any development that's approved under the Planning Act. And of course, that Planning Act approval is designed, required for almost any type of approval that would be required to fill in a wetland or develop houses on wetland, et cetera. Those are all removed. It's left up to the municipality to do that. And the conservation authorities are prohibited from providing the services to municipalities that they would need to do in order to assess the impact on those wetlands themselves. They actually prohibit, they gag the conservation authorities in that respect. Uh, and then beyond that, what's left over? What you have left over is activities that cause pollution or affect the ecological functioning of wetlands that are not development, but no, that is actually also removed from the scope of conservation authorities. Uh, they have changed the role of conservation authorities if this bill is passed from a conservation of land to a much more narrow and short-term focus on immediate flooding and erosion which is designed to remove any consideration of pollution or long-term uh, factors that might eventually affect flooding and erosion, but not immediately. It's designed to remove those from the purview of conservation authorities. So this means that you know, some estimates are that 80 to 90% of wetlands that are currently off limits for development will be uh, <coughs> open for development. There'll be no real effective mechanism of protecting them without you know, some massive rapid overhaul of municipal bylaws, which, which just isn't in place. And we're going to see a kind, if this passes, a sort of gold rush of developers trying to make applications before any of those changes can be made. Um, second, and this is the other 
big feature of the bill is a complete dismantling of regional planning. So what this means right now, we have uh, regional governments that are required to allocate how much land will be opened up for development in each, uh, in each lower tier municipality. So for example, in York region, the region of York has to decide how much land is needed and then allocate that between municipalities to places they're supposed to do it, to places where uh, they can actually be serviced properly, where you can actually provide sewage, where you can provide public transit. And you know, municipalities like Hamilton and Halton have done a great job in the most recent round of doing this, and Waterloo is another example, uh, in such a way that they actually don't need any more land or any non-trivial amount of land uh, in order to house everyone who needs to be housed. And so that they can actually vastly improve their public transit and uh, and provide more homes in the places where people want to live. And what the government has done is remove. They have, if if this bill is passed, it would strip that role from Halton and Waterloo and Durham and York and Peel altogether, so that lower tier municipalities are forced you know or allowed to just open up whatever land they like without regard to whether it's needed on a regional level and without the benefit of the regional planning staff who can spot when something is a scam so you have very often naive uh less experienced planning staff at the lower tier municipal level who will be left to decide these big planning applications and we know what this looks like that's why we created regional planning in the first place Physically, this means that development will be much more scattered over the landscape. You'll have little patches of uh, sprawl opening up here and there that are extremely hard to service with public transit, extremely hard to, to service with social services or even sewage. Uh, and, and they'll just spring up in isolation. And now, then the region will be left with the, the burden of often servicing them. And it won't be possible. So what this means is that we won't be able to get neighborhoods to uh, you know, lower car dependency and eliminate car dependency in the time we need because we'll instead be building even more car dependent neighborhoods. So it's physically gonna result in a very different form of development if this passes. Uh, and then third, and here's the big point, I, the government desperately wanted the, the headline item in this bill that everyone took note of to be creating more housing in existing neighborhoods, uh, creating more housing on public transit. And actually what they wanted to do is provoke this big uh, NIMBY response against it. So they could look like the good guys who were flipping over tables and, and like challenging NIMBYism in neighborhoods to make homes for people. The reality is that in Toronto, uh, the only major change to this bill is to expedite the time for uh, oh, brought about by this bill is to expedite uh, the period for updating zoning to conform with the major transit uh, station obligations from three years to one. And Toronto was already doing it uh, on a much faster timeline than legally required anyway. So there is not going to be a major change to get more housing built around major transit station areas. Uh, and moreover, there is not going to be a major change to get more homes added to neighborhoods. We already have in Toronto a plan uh, or a set of rules that allow up to three units within existing units in exist uh, within existing neighborhoods. What the environmental movement had been called calling for, and we've been calling for this with one voice with housing advocates, is a set of rules that would allow the creation of a lot of purpose-built. Uh, multifamily housing, uh, townhomes uh, in neighborhoods that are currently reserved for single detached homes. And it's urgent that we do this now because we have a vast number of homes that were built in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s that are bungalows, which were on average, you know, a thousand square foot feet at the time, or 1,025, 1,050 square feet. That was the average size of a single detached home up until 1975. And those are being torn down rapidly at a rapid pace. And the current rules don't allow them to be replaced with anything 
except another single detached home. And those homes, well, I'll give you an example in, uh, in Mississauga, the average new house that's being built is 3,900 square feet, or more than that, actually, right? It, it's, it's closer to 4,000 square feet than 3,900. Uh, so we cannot allow those plots of land though, and that square footage to be squandered on larger single detached homes. It is vital that when those lots are turned over, that we add three more compact homes in that same footprint. So we can bring those neighborhoods up to, uh, to transit supporting densities and, and so that we don't have to force families out into sprawl. We need the kind of housing that people will say, oh, I'll still have a low traffic street. I'll, you know, I'll have access to like a quieter neighborhood and, and I don't have to move into green fields. That's what we asked for. And the government provided something very weak. It is so watered down, the changes the government has uh, proposed in this bill, that by their own projections, this would only create 50,000 units of a total 1.5 million units that they're proposing to have created over the next 10 years. So it is a tiny pit. And their goal was to pretend that this was the main thrust of the legislation and provoke everyone into complaining about that so they could look like the good guys. No, this is a bill about assigning housing to the suburbs and accelerating sprawl into places that no one ever thought would be open for development, places that never should be for development. And what this means is that if they get their way, they're hoping to lock in planning permissions uh, for development on the vast majority of wetlands in the Greater Golden Horseshoe within uh, before their term is over and make it very difficult for governments to get rid of them after the fact. Not a lot of that housing is likely to get built within the next three years, but they're going to create a morass where the land values have gone up. It's a huge thing. So we, and what all this amounts to is that not only is this a plan to accelerate sprawl, to sacrifice wetlands and farmlands, and not build house, much housing in existing neighborhoods. It's actually going to worsen the housing supply shortage. And that is because we are, it's going to encourage the distribution of homes and the form of homes that are much less efficient so that we are squandering square footage on larger homes rather than more compact homes. And we're putting it in places where it is much more resource intensive to build them and where it's much less efficient to serve them. So the same amount of labor, the same amount of construction materials will provide far fewer homes, we think, as a result of this legislation than they would if we pursued a smart growth approach. Uh, so those are the big points. And I just want to underline that buried in this, uh, the few changes that actually would encourage uh, you know, more housing around major transit station areas in some places, they have mix these up with changes that won't deliver more housing. And in particular, they have, you know, mingled with these changes for uh, rezoning of existing uh, transit station areas. They have removed the capacity of the city of Toronto to impose the green standard on new buildings. The green standard requires things like uh, modes of cladding that uh, would reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of buildings. It also uh, includes many things like circulation that are able to ensure you know, good pedestrian access to buildings. Uh, these are all done through something called site planning. Uh, and the government's bill would, if passed, uh, remove those external cladding questions, those external circulation questions from the purview of site planning. So the city of Toronto could no longer impose its green standard. And that is the green standard is a central feature of Ontario of Toronto's plan to meet its climate obligations. Building related emissions are a huge part of, uh, uh, of Toronto's uh, emissions. The other part is transportation related emissions. Uh, so they've removed the capacity of Toronto to use the tools it's using to get rid of building related emissions. And by pushing sprawl and diverting density away from Toronto, uh, they're also removing uh, the key tool that we need in order to transform our existing neighborhoods, 
to get rid of uh, car dependency and uh, tackle our transportation related issues. Anyway, that was an overview. It wasn't, I, I understand it wasn't very gracefully presented, but we are rushing to pick through this bill and find out what's really in it. Uh, so uh, that's the best I can do. There will be another uh, webinar on Monday where I hope the presentation will be a bit better for you. Thank you so much, Phil. We appreciate that. I was typing furiously, trying to take notes of what you're saying. Obviously, I will um, uh, review the recorded meeting <laughs> and take a bit better notes for everyone here. Um, Diane, or does anyone have questions for Phil? Actually, let's open up for questions. We got about five minutes, and then we'll hop into well, Diane's you presentation. Can take questions for Phil after, because I'm going to have to go in yes. twenty. Yes. Okay. So Diane first. Yes. Go ahead. Sure. Um, anyway, thank you, Phil. Excellent points, um, including some of the ones I was going to make, um, but great. So, uh, I mean, the short version is, yes, this is a travesty. It's another abuse of power by the Ford government, unfortunately, totally foreseeable once we knew the results of the election in June. Um, so I want to talk uh, just briefly about democracy, sustainability, livability, and affordability. Um, from a democracy point of view, this uh, definitely continues the pattern of abuse of governing power by the Ford government, uh, and especially their pattern of using massive omnibus bills with minimal public consultation launched on people with short notice at uh, vulnerable times and ignoring environmental rights, uh, such as what, what the Environmental Bill of Rights was set up to protect and what my office uh, used to try to try to guard. Uh, the content, again, as we've seen consistently from this government, it's not based on good public policy analysis by the civil service. It's based on an industry wish list. And uh, yet another reminder that it's very bad for Toronto to be so under the thumb of a government elected primarily in the rural and exurban areas. Um, the Ford government and its agencies, such as Metrolinx, keep hurting Toronto. Um, seem to be doing it very deliberately, don't seem to care at all what we have to say, and especially anybody in the downtown. Um, as great cities go, Toronto is very weak, uh, has is too weak to effectively deliver many of the mandates that have been downloaded on it, uh, and others that have been accepted like count by council, such as the Climate Emergency Declaration, and is um, facing terrible challenges to deliver transform TO, which is critical to our future. And this bill will make that already very difficult job much more difficult. Um, there are solutions. Toronto should be a charter city with much po greater powers of self-government. That is one of the pledges I signed during the last election campaign. And I guess I should have said, I hope most of you know, I am newly elected um, and I will become the Councillor for University Rosedale Ward 11 in Toronto on November the 15th. Uh, Toronto should be protected from endless unfounded downloads and, and at least should have the authority to raise the revenue necessary to do the jobs assigned to it. Uh, Toronto is already the sixth largest government in Canada and has uh, many more difficult delivery challenges than the other levels of government. Can that be achieved? Uh, well, it's a political question again. It would take sustained public pressure to achieve this, mostly to have to come from outside the city of Toronto, probably cannot be achieved under a conservative provincial government. Um, second big issue is sustainability. And from my point of view, this is yet another of Ford's many and consistent attacks on environmental protection and sustainability, which we have seen from him from the day he was elected and even before he took office. Um, you know, eliminating my office as environmental commissioner was only one of many. Um, key damages from this bill, Phil went through a number of them, turbocharging sprawl, which is Ontario's oil sands. It's the largest source of our emissions and um, driven by a very powerful, very wealthy industry that profits from doing, frankly, the wrong thing. Um, weakening the conservation authorities, forcing them to give up land that they have already protected um, for, to, to developers, uh, I mean, outrageous, hard to believe, um, eviscerating wetland protection. Uh, I, my last wetland report, I put the link to it in the chat. Uh, I documented how extraordinarily ineffective Ontario's protection of wetlands was, that we already had hundreds of years of backlog in protecting wetlands 
but they've changed the definition so that almost all wetlands will lose any kind of protection, even though the protection was already weakened. Those wetlands are not only essential for wildlife habitat, they are absolutely critical for our water supply um, to protect us from floods and droughts. That's where the water goes in the storms as climate change accelerates. Wetlands will be more and more essential. And once they are destroyed, they are almost impossible to restore. They are irreplaceable, incredibly valuable. Most of them we've already destroyed. The few that are left are of critical importance. And this bill is designed to destroy them. Um, Phil already mentioned eliminating authority for site plan control, which is essential for things like the Toronto Green Standards. It also eliminates any authority for bird protection. Uh, you probably already know how desperate the situation of wild birds is. We've already lost the Dawn Forest, the, sorry, the Dawn Chorus in most of Ontario's woods. Um, a huge number of birds die every year. Uh, colliding with buildings and Toronto's right on a migration pathway and eliminating authority for that. I mean, these are very minor changes that buildings need to be able to give the birds a chance of successfully completing their migration. That's all going to be eliminated. And also uh, limiting protection, the city's ability to protect green space and urban trees, which will be increasingly important. Um, third point is livability. Um, this, because of the way that municipal financing has been governed by the provincial government, and as I mentioned, the inability of the city to be uh, have the authority to do what it needs to do, the city is heavily dependent on development charges to fund essential public services, which are particularly more essential as hundreds of thousands more people come into the city. And I saw the headline this morning, the federal government's planning to increase immigration to 500,000 a year. Um, lots of reasons for that, but again, that increases the pressure on public space, public amenities in the city. And the city depends on development charges to pay for um, community space, parks, libraries, public spaces, other urban amenities that are critical to livability. Now, the Ford government has already cut that money 40% just at the time that both land values and construction costs have soared. So cutting uh, by well more than half the city's ability to deliver any of those amenities, which will have hugely damaging effects on the city. And now this bill will cut them even further. Most of the options for replacing this revenue require Ford's approval, like road tolls or income tax. And uh, I... I don't have any evidence that we'll get it. Uh, it we've seen this pattern of uh, degrading public services, degrading the ability of governments to deliver public services so that uh, the rich turn away from public services and build private services, which then again reduce the public support and pressure for good public services. Uh, in terms of affordability, um, there's lots of uh, people talking about this. This is being sold as a solution to affordable housing, and it's not. Um, and at the very same time, it's reducing some of the protections that we have right now for affordable housing, including the um, uh, tenant protection program during redevelopment, which is really important for the many people who are being displaced uh, by redevelopment as it occurs faster and faster. And simultaneously, we know that there is a desperate need for provincial funds to subsidize deeply affordable housing. The city cannot possibly fund that on its own and we're not getting any money. So this is uh, a, a yet another brick in the wall of a continuing generation long right wing process, which Mike Harris um, really kicked off in Ontario and which Ford has uh, continued aggressively of impoverishing vulnerable people so they can't afford a place to live. And we see that across the board. We see it with inadequate minimum wage. We see it with totally inadequate Ontario disability support payments. We see it with Ontario Works at $700 a month. We see it capping low wage workers such as early childhood educators so they can't afford to live in places like my ward. Um, the Bill 124, keeping wages for nurses too low so that we have a nursing crisis. This is uh, a, a piece of a package. These aren't accidents. There is a consistent program of making developers wealthy while destroying uh, our shared future. So what can we do about it? 
it comes back down to general political organizing. Um, the city cannot stop it. The city is entirely under the thumb of the province, as we have seen over and over. Um, the city could publicly protest and ask for delay and meaningful consultation, as some of the other cities have. It is difficult for council to make a decision right now. Uh, the outgoing councillors are basically lame duck and busily moving out of their offices. The new councillors do not yet speak for the city. There are no council meetings, certainly in Toronto, booked in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I would certainly support a protest, but we have no reason to think that Ford cares in the least about that. Um, what we have seen um, over the last four years is that he doesn't like being publicly booed. So anything that you can do to organize with his audiences so that he gets booed, that does affect his opinion. Um, he seems to listen to his large donors. So anyone who's got an ability to influence them may be able to do something. And he also seems to listen to a certain extent to large influential rural groups like the Anglers and Hunters and the uh, Federation of Ontario Agriculture. Um, but um, in terms of public protests from downtown people, I haven't seen any evidence that it affects them at all. So that's, that's my preliminary take. Having said that, as you can all imagine, uh, I have not had the opportunity to read these 277 pages. Uh, my priority at the moment is to have an office ready to go uh, on the 15th of November when I um, take up my responsibilities, uh, which include already 120 new towers proposed in my ward and 270 total development applications, at least according to the list of a couple of weeks ago. So the, the pressure is on enormously already, and this bill will make uh, the task of anyone who cares about livability, affordability, sustainability, or democracy much more difficult in this province. Uh, I did just have a little chip in. I think, uh, I think Diane and I might have slightly different um, I guess positionalities in this. <laughs> I probably because Diane is about to start uh, as a counselor. I do think that uh, you know this bill absolutely should not pass. It's going to make things much more difficult for municipal governments uh, and, and in the city of Toronto in particular. But we should not let municipal governments off the hook if that does happen. And let me just be very clear what I mean. And that is, uh, first of all, a lot of these changes, uh, we will have to do everything we can if they pass to mitigate them through changes to bylaws. Uh, and if uh, these development charges are removed, this cannot be an excuse for the city of Toronto not providing those services. We need to raise property taxes to fill the gap, and we just directly point to the government. There's no off the hook. Like We have not raised property taxes or brought property taxes in Toronto up to the same level as uh, surrounding municipalities, let alone places like Durham, and there is no excuse for your councillor refusing to do that to fill in as much of the gap uh, as possible as created by these changes. You've got to keep the pressure on. Uh, and a lot of the changes to uh, site planning, we have identified mechanisms which won't be nearly as good. They'll be far inferior. But if we're willing to be aggressive about it and make some people cry, uh, we can fix some of those problems potentially through transferring them to zoning. It will be a little bit of a more of a blunt instrument as compared to having them done, and so we expect councillors to deliver on all of those things at least to mitigate the damage, uh, even as we fight the Ford government and hope that it's not necessary. I expect Phil that you'll be in my office to tell me all about that, but first I have to have an office. Sure, <laughs> happy to do that. Okay, I've got a, a few minutes. If anybody has questions for me. Yes, absolutely. So we can do questions if people want to raise their hands um, or if people just want to speak up. If there's a lot of people speaking over each other, then we'll do raise the hands. But if people just want to ask questions, you can, you can start yeah. from that and please I'll start keep, taking notes. Please keep the questions short and make sure they're a question. Yeah. Oh, Patricia, do you want to ask something? Yes, I do. Uh, I noticed that the there's the posting on the ERO is open until November 24th, but this has gone through second reading. Can somebody just quickly summarize the, like, the timing of that? And is that okay? Right. Well, I mean, again, we, we've, 
we've consistently seen the government doesn't give a damn about public consultation. I mean, they've been very explicit about it. Second reading is approval in principle. So that has already happened. What happens between second and third reading is intended to be fine tuning. So the legislature has already given approval in principle to the to the basic uh, uh, lines of this bill. That's what bill, the second reading means. And um, the Ford has been able to maintain key, complete control of his caucus. So unless they agree, they will vote down probably every, I mean, their, their pattern in the, up until now has been to vote down every opposition um, amendment, no matter how valid, no matter how well supported, unless they decide to do it. So yeah, I don't know whether they've uh, agreed to have a standing committee. Sorry, I haven't had time to haven't had time to find out. Oh, and so it's, there, you know, it's the up to the MPPs to deal with issues at city at uh, Queens Park. So I it bet. will be going to committee. Uh, I'll tell you which committee. It's going to a strange committee that you wouldn't expect. So I will give you the name of the committee, and I, I will, in all likelihood, be appearing there. Uh, I apologize. It, it's such an obscure committee that they've chosen to refer it to that. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Hold on a second. Uh, well, while you look that up, can I ask a second question? Go ahead. Um, so there's no obligation for the to take the posting time on the ERO into consideration. Well, the, the courts have refused consistently to enforce the Environmental Bill of Rights. Um, and it was one of the things that I was doing as commissioner was working very hard with the different government uh, departments and with the deputies and the ministers themselves to get them to comply with the act uh, as much as I could. But the Ford government doesn't care and the courts have never imposed any consequences. They've been uh, at least twice found to have breached the bill, but there's no consequences, so they don't care. And how do you, as a municipal councillor, budgets have been passed. Uh, people have set official plans, parks plans, et cetera. These don't comply with the rules. How does a municipality, like what obligation does a municipality have to actually do this? And what happens if a municipality just doesn't comply? Well, uh, I mean, Ford has shown that he's quite happy to bring the hammer down the municipalities and doesn't care about their opinions. I, I expect. Um, that given the mayor and council that we have, that the city will be making every effort to comply with the law. This isn't a, uh, a law breaking group. It will be very difficult to comply. Um, and yes, absolutely, Phil, if you've got good ways, or at least some ways to still try to protect the public interest, despite what's been happening, you know, I at least will be looking for it. But the when it comes down to it, the way the way Ontario the way Canadian law is structured is the province sets the rules and the municipalities have no choice but to comply. Can we appeal to a federal no. level? The federal government doesn't have any ability to override the provincial government within its area of jurisdiction, and it has complete constitutional jurisdiction over um, municipal matters. And what is the the hammer? Because I kind of feel what we're going to lose in parkland dedication may be cheaper than, like the fine may be cheaper. Um, like what's the hammer the province drops? Um, well, I mean, we, we there are bound to be enforcement provisions in the bill. As I said, I haven't had time to read the bill yet, but the city only has authority that the province gives it. And so once the authority has been removed. So for example, think of the Toronto Green Standards. The city, uh, I mean, one of my complaints has been that the city doesn't have any follow-up enforcement of the Toronto Green Standards, but there has been quite good voluntary compliance by industry um, because it's the law and because otherwise the city has the legal right to hold up approvals. Now we won't. So already, anytime the city asks for something that a developer doesn't like, they just say, okay, you know, uh, go jump in the lake. We're going to the, um, the Land Use Planning Appeal Tribunal and the Land Use Planning Appeal Tribunal is governed only by the provincial rules and not by what the city wants. But there's gonna be a backlog. They're <laughs> all not gonna get through before the next election possibly. Well, the, um, 
I mean, as, as Phil said, there are uh, rights that accrue once an application is made. The fact that there's a long backlog to get the appeal done isn't necessarily going to reduce those rights. One of the things that would have been good um, for the city would be to have some kind of expiry dates on, on real estate approvals so that people who just t take old approvals and sit on them and don't actually develop it, lose it. But I don't think we got that in this bill. And, I mean, I'm just going to jump in, uh, Patricia. Thank you for asking your questions. We need to yeah. move on I'm to make sure that people. Go. I'm going to have to go. Um, but listen, Steph, thank you very, very much for this. I uh, I appreciate every, everything that you're all doing. I hope that we will see a lot of political organizing. I, I don't have a lot of faith that marches in Toronto are going to change anything, but this is definitely a case for powerful political organizing. And sometimes, as we've seen with the, the destruction of the Duffin Creek wetlands, occasionally they will back back, back down, um, but it takes a lot of people power. For sure. So, Thank in you. terms of actually reversing these changes, I mean, though, it, so those locked in uh, approvals, it's very long in the future now. We've got three years to wait. But I mean, there is a path to a subsequent provincial government uh, legislating away some of those rights. Uh, you know, we don't have constitutionally enshrined property rights in Canada. So, if they're willing to state expressly that they want to remove those rights, a, a subsequent provincial government should do that. And certainly that's something we should be asking for. It's something we asked for, from Diane when she was with the provincial Greens and she kindly agreed to when it came to approvals for developments on wetlands. Yeah. And I think that in some cases we should be doing that here, uh, particularly in the same case. Where well, there are I, I, yeah. development on that I know I did my absolute damnedest to try to keep the board government from getting this majority because we knew it would be disastrous and it is. Um, but anyway, I did my best. It didn't work. Now I'm going to try counsel. Thank you very much, everybody. Sorry, I really have to go. Um, and I, I'll look forward to seeing the your notes, Steph. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. So there is um, a piece that we didn't touch on that I want to make sure I did because I'd be doing a disservice if we didn't point it out. And that is there is a hidden in this bill is a piece of, uh, of legislation that's designed to allow the minister to remove Toronto's rental replacement policy. And this is a huge disaster if this goes ahead, because what it would mean is that uh, builders would be able to tear down existing rental stock, evict all the current tenants who have maybe been living there for a long time and have like long-term rents that they can afford uh, that they haven't been able to go up and then tear down the building and those people are a rendered homeless right now they have no right to return again at the same rent on toronto used to have a policy that required builders when they tear down a rental apartment and build a new one to house every one of those people so the problem of gentrification and displacement that you saw in other in other places it didn't happen nearly as much in toronto you could build new housing and not cost any current tenants their unit. They want to take that away. So if that happens, then this whole, the whole reason why de like, you know, desiccation around transit station has been so uh, relatively accepted in Toronto, it, it's, it's going to be a tech. They want to provoke a negative reaction against densification. Uh, they want that. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Uh, Kay, LG, do you want to ask your question? Yes, yes. Uh, Diane outlined her ideas about how we might uh, defeat this bill. Phil, do you have anything to add to that? I'm just thinking about strategies to where, are there any weak points uh, other than what she, she talked about rural communities and, and uh, booing for it and so on. Do you have any other ideas? Well, I think uh, there is a point of vulnerability on the green building standard. I think that uh, there's an opportunity to, it's possible that they didn't intend this outcome. They look to be removing site plan approval because it was an extra procedural stage without considering that there were some things done at that procedural stage that were meant. So they could conceivably uh, just simply tweak the legislation to allow uh, you know, uh, cladding and issues like related to environmental protection uh, to be continued to be uh, regulated through site planning. 
And I think that's one where they might give. Uh, and I think if you draw attention to that, you've got to say it's not going to slow down the amount of housing. We, we think that you did this by mistake. Can you fix it? So you, if, you, if you take a kind of a non-confrontational approach and just bury them in emails about that, I think there's an opportunity. Uh, the second piece is in uh, you know, defeating it either way. Get Toronto proactively to commit to accommodate much more housing in Toronto than the government is actually planning to assign to it. The whole pretext of this bill is that Toronto just needs to be forced to do stuff that it, you know that it's not trying to do things properly, and therefore we don't have time to wait around. They're using all the sustainability stuff as an excuse not to house everyone who lives there, and therefore we need to smash everything. If Toronto, and this is what we asked for in the municipal election, if Toronto comes out ahead and say, "Listen, this is our plan to house you know, 1.4 million new residents by 20, uh, 2021, which is more than Ford wants to assign," Ford is only assigning to Toronto. 5,000 more people than Toronto was pre pre planning to house anyway within the next 10 years. So if we say we can house way more, we undercut the whole, um, the whole pretext for this, which is that there's no room in Toronto and they need to open up wetlands in the 905 in order to build sprawl. If we just house those people here, that's not necessary. So that's the other piece. And the third is just really kind of discipline our speech so that we are not complaining about too much density in neighborhoods. And we're really saying we want density in our neighborhoods. We don't want sprawl and we're willing to embrace density to prevent sprawl. Like you gotta be consistent so that you cannot be framed as like an MVMC, we can't do it there. So we have to do it in, in sprawl. Thanks. Okay, where are we? Next person is Michael Parkinson. Hey, that's me. Um, I had two questions really quickly. One is um, around designated growth areas or, or uh, subdivisions uh, or development that's already approved. And it's my understanding that uh, there's very little, if nothing, the municipality can do to accelerate or put an expiry date on it. So that's one question. Um, and the second question was really around how you know civil society might support uh, area conservation authorities and, and, and councils at, at lower and, and upper tiers to um, put pressure on the government. Um, thanks. So in terms of, so you're saying, how do we accelerate creation of new housing uh, within areas that are already targeted for densification? And it's the, 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 one, the, the real measure that the government has shied away from and which is desperately needed is this. We got to stop squandering resources on making existing small homes bigger, right? What we have, the real underlying feature of this, this whole supply crunch, it's not that we don't have enough land open for development. It's not even that we don't have enough approvals. It's that we do not have enough labor and enough construction materials uh, being directed to build more homes because they're being squandered on bigger ones. So what we need to do is crack down on McMansionization and what that might look like is a per unit cap on how big a unit should be. So on any given lot, you know, the average house size that we were building in the 1970s was 1,025, 1,050 square feet. If we say we're just not going to build any more new homes or expand homes to beyond 1,200 square feet, that frees up a lot of resources, then that will then be directed to creating more homes because that that's a really it's, it's a real problem right like we just don't have enough units to create all the square foot or enough enough materials and enough labor to create all the square footage we need so by cracking down on the waste we direct that investment that those resources and that labor to building the stuff that we do need okay thank you michael now does anyone else here I would like to ask a question. You don't have to raise your hand. You can just speak up. We have about 100 people here or 90 people here. Any other questions for about Bill 23? <clears throat> for, for Phil anyways. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna open up the floor to um, Phil. Thank you so much for talking today. I uh, really appreciate you. I know you have a meeting shortly. You're, you can slide out anytime you want. 
Um, but I want to open up the floor now to any other groups or organizations that are here that would like to that would like to talk. Does anyone want to announce anything or um, talk about a meeting you're be having? Any new press releases that were released? Um, but yeah. Hi, Steph. Yes. Um, it's Kathy White. Okay. I'm, just, I'm reading something that came from the Ontario Stone sandstone and gravel um, it says of major significance the government is plan is also planning to seek input on integrating a place to grow growth plan for the greater golden horseshoe and the provincial policy statement into a single province-wide planning policy document so this is plan this is coming down as well the process will provide Oscar the opportunity to correct previous changes to the growth plan, which threaten the availability of close to market aggregate. And it said, there's no question this this government is full speed ahead and your team at Oscar is right there with them. So there are more changes coming, push, push by industry for sure. Does anyone want to provide any additional information regarding that? So Does those changes are already proposed there is an ero posting for a pps and growth plan review it is not formally part of bill 23 it's one of the 60-day postings on the ero correct currently and that has specifically to do with gravel or aggregate sorry it has to do with reviewing the entirety of the provincial policy statement which exists under uh, section three of the planning act which all municipalities currently have to be consistent with in terms of their planning decisions and planning documents. Um, and then the growth plan itself is established under a separate piece of legislation, but the proposal seems to be to blend the two together. Um, so not really sure on what the legal mechanism would be for that or how what that would look like, whether that would mean repealing the, the growth plan act to just combine it into PPS. Um, it's also unclear how they can do that without also needing to reopen the Greenbelt plan and the Niagara Escarpment plan, uh, as there is a degree of interrelationship between all three of those documents. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> um, so that definitely concerning. Uh, I think, yes, definitely concerning. And we can definitely take time to create a specific breakout room for that one if people want to specifically talk about that instead of say the bill 23 is there currently anyone else that has any information regarding bill 23 anyone wants to provide more details maybe about housing or what it actually would mean regarding the site control uh, maybe heritage maybe um yeah there's so many integral pieces of of bill 23 uh, or does anyone have any questions about just yeah wondering a bit more about something I'm just wondering what's going to happen to the um, to the uh, regional official plans that we just finished. Um, are they going to be, if this goes through, will they be enti entirely negated? That, Anyone here that is, to answer that, you can. That isn't clear. Um, those plans haven't been approved, and we hope some of them aren't. We hope that Hamilton, Saltons, and Waterloo's are. but they haven't been approved. It's not clear from the legislation what this effect would be if they are approved as is uh, before the coming into force of the act, which might be the case, uh, then we wouldn't have another regional planning exercise or uh, boundary expansion exercise for another uh, several years. But if they overthrow regional planning and one of the ERO postings is talking about getting rid of the whole growth plan for the greater golden horseshoe anyway, then in a way they would lock in all of the boundary expansions they've already done and then potentially allow new piecemeal ones from lower tier municipalities on uh, uh, in addition to it. But that would depend on the ERO posting. The bill itself does not seem to remove the existing plans that have been approved. Sorry I'm, folks, I'm off, thank you. 
Sorry, I was particularly interested also in, um, in Niagara, we managed to get in a, what we called option 3C, which is a, um, um, a greatly improved upon um, natural heritage system from the PPS and um, wondering where that would stand. And, and we have not been approved yet. So Phil's gone now, he had to leave the meeting, but I'm sure with the 82 people left, we have, I'm sure we have other people that have been reviewing this bill, um, have kind of maybe found information. Um, is there any other people here from any organizations that have released any reports that would like to announce them? Okay, so sounds like we're all in our learning phase. Oh, two participants have raised their hands. Uh, let's see, Jeff. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm with the um, Federation of North Toronto Residents Associations and the Federation of Urban Neighbourhoods. Um, there's been quite a bit of um, obviously sectoral review of the legislation um, from like an environmental perspective, an affordable housing perspective, a um, municipal perspective. Uh, hopefully, I, hopefully AMO is looking at this. Um, and professional planners uh, should be looking at it. Um, and the, so I assume that each of these sectors will make arrangements, register to, to request to present um, at the uh, committee hearings uh, on the, the week of the 16th, well, 16th and 17th in Toronto, um, and then earlier in Brampton and Markham. Um, but the, the idea occurs about putting together a kind of um, cross-sectoral um, would be, would be um, it's great to have sectoral analyses, sectoral issues, but there should be some cross-sectoral um, integrated coordinated analysis as well. Um, and I, I'm just listening to this, there's so much uh, similarity, um, obviously there are sector specific issues, but there's a lot of similarity and, and, and partly around democracy is, is what and livability, sustainability. These are the common themes across all the critiques. And I'm, I'm just saying, I, if there's um, somebody, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll take some leadership with that. Uh, somebody that has you know, resources to, uh, to be able to bring that together. We, we should come together, not only as individuals and as sectors, but also as civil society in effect. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Kay, do you wanna say something? Yeah. Yes, um, an another little known probably uh, aspect of, of this bill is changes to the Ontario Heritage Act. And of course, these are attacking designation and so on, which is a, a favorite bugbear. But the part that that a lot of heritage organizations are talking about is is a change to the Heritage Act that would make it more difficult to designate um, properties um, and and be, by requiring two criteria. And why we're concerned about that is we feel like people have been expanding the notion of what's important from like traditionally, yes, it was houses bit, built by well-to-do white people generally. Uh, but, but increasingly, we've been trying to think about designating areas um, uh, significant to Black, Indigenous, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, co other communities. And, and this change will make that really difficult. So we feel this could be an embarrassing moment for the new Minister of Multiculturalism and Citizenship, who happens to be Mike Ford. So that's that's an area that that we are planning. We're hoping to present to the standing committee, and also reaching out to a number of heritage organizations, uh, you know, across Canada. Um, and I do want to also mention that the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals and and Architectural Conservancy Ontario, which I'm associated with, are really concerned about about retrofitting buildings. We're really concerned about climate change. And know that existing buildings are a, a really big contributor. So, so we feel there's two points we have in common there. But I just want to make you aware of this heritage angle uh, because I think it's a potentially embarrassing one and maybe one that uh, uh, 
could be a rallying cry for a number of people in the different sectors. Thank you, Kay. Um, so I guess what I will do, if anyone else wants to, does anyone else have any, I guess, background information that they've done, any research that they would like to talk about? Um, I'm just going through some of our background information about what this bill will do. Uh, just because there are there is some information that was missed, um, kind of when we we're talking about <laughs> stuff. Um, so one of the things at a meeting yesterday we discussed for affordable housing um, was the removal of uh, development charges for housing. I know they talked about that, but at the meeting, someone mentioned that it would Toronto would lose approximately around two hundred million dollars a year on these development charges that would go specifically for housing services uh, and programs that are already set in place or are already planned to be to be implemented. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if someone else wants to mention, talk about that, if they know more. Also, there was, um, yeah, so the rental housing protection plans will be removed, as well as um, the development costs for, um, that goes towards water, sewage, and transit, as well as the It'll include stricter inclusionary zoning. And this is interesting is that I, what I believe is technically municipalities could set higher standards for a number of affordable units in the new developments. This new plan will set a maximum. Um, so it'll say develop, there's only a, developers only have to put a maximum of 5% units to be affordable. Um, and it's capped at a length of 25 years. So previously, other municipalities could do more than than five percent, say twenty or twenty five, depending on the need in the community. I'm not sure if anyone wants to talk about the importance of that and the impact that that would have, um, as well as we know about the water conservation authorities, um, and then we can also go into uh, oversight of quality and and and. And so the site control, from my understanding, is that the site control was going to be eliminated for housing developments that were 10 units or lower. Um, so any uh, it, that would impact any houses, individual houses would lose site control. And that has to do with drainage, landscaping. So that could potentially impact, like Diane was saying, with tree canopy, um, expectation that um, that the building be aesthetically the same um, as the the area that's being built in. So if you're in a heritage area that you typically want the buildings to look relatively the same, there's no no there's now no control of that. Anyone else want to mention talk about that? You can throw your hand up or just start talking if you want. <laughs> also the Ontario Land Tribunal, uh, it's going to be restrict the engagement in land tribunal hearings. You know, third party people no longer and organizations will no longer be able to uh, be involved in the Ontario Land Tribunal unless it's your direct kind of involvement in it. So I know uh, ourselves, I'm involved in <laughs> groups so that we would not be able to be involved in those um, because we were not um, people directly around the land where, where the issue was going to be occurring. Not sure if anyone has any uh, more information about that. <laughs> Again, I'm just rambling. I found all this information online. We've done a bunch of people done reports, um, but I'm not the expert in this. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not um, a counselor or from a large organization. I'm, you know, just from 50 by 30. That's been, you know, doing a lot of research. But I know that some other people have been doing other research. Does anyone else want to kind of read off anything that 